Director. I'm the Credentials Team Lead uh, for IFMA's uh, Professional Development Department. I have been with IFMA now um, going on 10 years. Uh, I have a background in uh, healthcare and then healthcare credentialing. So that's how I came to be affiliated with IFMA Credentials. It's a little bit different, uh, but basically it is uh, assisting folks with their career, which uh, is the part of my job that I really do uh, enjoy. Not so much uh, the paperwork and the documentation and the answer into ANSI, but that's all part of it as well. So um, I'm all, my team is always available. I have, um, Crystal is not on the call, Crystal Herrera, she's actually off today, but uh, she is our credentials coordinator. So anytime you need something and you can't reach me, uh, you can always uh, typically reach Crystal and uh, she will be able to help you as well. So uh, unless anyone has any questions to uh, start off with, uh, we'll get started with the presentation. And at the end, afterwards, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. And then the uh, credentials email will be on the uh, slides. And I'll also give you my personal email uh, before, we, before we complete things. And we start off by saying that this is kind of, kind of a combination. It's primarily a CFM recertification, but I am mentioning uh, our other two credentials as well. And then a little bit about the actual CFM and the application and that process, uh, which because obviously we have a couple of folks that have not done that yet. So we'll skip through that pretty quickly unless someone wants to stop me with a question. And I uh, just want to get started by saying uh, facility managers today uh, are, are not just uh, maintenance personnel. It hasn't been the case for quite a while, uh, but uh, FMs are actually expected to impact uh, the bottom line of whichever organization they are working with uh, by reducing costs, uh, improving productivity, mitigating risks, which uh, particularly in the US is a huge issue. Uh, and improving uh, revenue generating capacity. So um, they're, they're much more active in uh, the organization as a whole uh, than they have been in the past. And uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the uh, 11 core competencies for uh, facility management. Um, we come up with these by doing a, a global job task analysis every five to seven years. And we will be starting uh, a new one probably in the coming, not, not this year, but our fiscal year ends in June. So when I say 22, that means uh, July of 21 starts our uh, 22 fiscal year. But we will be starting that in the coming year. And there are lots of opportunities, particularly for CFMs to participate in these activities for uh, recertification uh, activity credit. So uh, keep that in mind when those emails go out and start asking uh, for your help. And then um, the top reasons to pursue an IFMA credential. And like I said, we're focusing primarily on the CFMs, but we, there are two certificate credentials that IFMA has, which if you manage folks, uh, these are particularly crucial uh, for those for bringing them um, into the uh, FM world where everyone speaks the same language. Uh, everybody has uh, you know, confidence in their ability to do their jobs. So um, the three reasons that uh, most folks pursue an IFMA credential is to uh, improve and confirm job capabilities, to gain uh, knowledge and qualification, and then to earn professional credibility. Uh, and currently we have more than uh, 16,000 active uh, IFMA credential holders and more than 100 countries. Um, and we had a few years ago, our research department did some research on uh, the value of IFMA credentials. And uh, some of the things that uh, were determined from that was that um, there is an ROI uh, on investing in your career as an FM. And um, the statistical information from this study that was done showed it to be uh, 15 to one for credential holders. Uh, and on average, IFMA credentials led to a $6,000 salary increase within the first year. This was primarily for CFMs, uh, not so much for the certificate holders, but typically it does affect that as well. 
and uh, IFMA credentials have been uh, internationally recognized uh, for over 25 years now. And uh, most of you are aware, I'm sure, that we have three credentials currently. Uh, the FMP and the SFP are certificate programs, which means uh, you purchase um, the manuals, you purchase the program, you study the material, uh, you pass a final assessment. The FMP has four uh, courses, the SFP has three. And once you pass all the courses, then you can apply for the credential. Uh, our only certification is the CFM. And that's an actual certification. There's no required coursework for this. Uh, there are eligibility requirements, which we will get into uh, shortly. And again, the FMP and the SFP are based on uh, studying the material and then uh, passing the final assessments. Uh, the programs are completely uh, online now, unless someone chooses to purchase uh, the hard copy manuals. Most people are not doing that uh, these days. We kind of had to wean off of that, but, but currently uh, they're available, but most people uh, are just doing the e-study. And we, do, uh, we have implemented virtual classes for this since uh, since COVID started it really cut into our live um, classroom courses that we typically offer over the course of a year but we are up and running with virtual courses and uh, we're doing we're, we're processing probably 100 FMP applications a month between 100 and 120 that's how many FMPs we're adding to the fold uh, each month and that's been the case for about the last year and a half. Um, all of our credentials are ANSI accredited. There's two different accreditations. Uh, one is for our certificate programs. One is for the certification, but the FMP and the SFP are uh, currently uh, ANSI accredited. Now our pinnacle credential, our certification of course is the CFM. Uh, it's internationally recognized. Uh, we have close to 3,000 current CFMs over the course of the last 25 years. Uh, we've had uh, a little over 6,000 CFMs. Of course, some of those uh, have retired just because of the, uh, the age bracket that many of our uh, CFMs are in. And so we're seeing uh, each year uh, more and more of those retire. So we're needing, uh, we're needing the new ones to come in and and take up the, and take over for those guys. Um, it, the CFM validates experience and demonstrates industry expertise. And uh, once certified, um, the CFM has to maintain that certification by recertifying every three years. And that ensures that um, the CFM is keeping up with any changes to the industry and um, is current on uh, what's currently uh, going on. There are eligibility requirements for the CFM. Um, the basic is three years of experience if one holds either a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in facility management. Uh, and then without that, uh, five years of FM experience. And when I say FM experience, uh, we saw previously the list of the 11 competencies. There are four primary competencies, what we call the foundational ones, which um, the exam is really heavily weighted in those areas. And that's O&M, leadership and strategy, project management, and finance and business. Um, and so when, I, when we look at eligibility for uh, someone who's wanting uh, to sit for the exam, we look at their experience in each of the competency areas, but primarily in those, because the others, uh, they're important, but, uh, and obviously communication is one of those areas. It, it's really important, but it's not weighted as heavily as for instance, leadership and strategy or operations and maintenance are. Uh, the exam is 180 questions, there's a four hour time limit, and it's proctored at Prometic Testing Centers. We just today actually got permission uh, from ANSI to do a six month pilot uh, with a live remote proctoring. Uh, obviously, this is a result of the COVID issues and uh, so many of the uh, exam centers worldwide have been closed. They're open in the US now, um, almost everywhere in the US, but a lot of um, places, particularly in the Middle East, um, 
have not had a center open for eight months. And so uh, we had to apply for ANSI for permission to offer live remote proctoring and Prometric still does it. Um, but the, uh, the test taker can do it uh, in their home. There's a long list of requirements and they've got to meet certain standards because obviously uh, the exam security is a big concern. But uh, effective February the 1st, um, anyone taking the exam will be allowed to choose uh, remote proctoring. So I didn't change the slide because it just happened about an hour before this started. We just found out about it. And so uh, there is a recertification requirement. Uh, you'll find that any certification, uh, wh whether it's FM, whether it's uh, healthcare, whether it's regardless of what it is, is going to require recertification. Um, that's what makes it different from a, uh, say, a certificate program, which is lifetime. So um, we're going to go farther into those requirements um, in just a minute. Um, the process for earning the CFM uh, is pretty straightforward. First, you have to meet the eligibility requirements and assess your readiness to prepare for the exam. You submit your application and the payment through the IFMA website, and there's a special website for credentials that we call CAMP. It's the Credential Application and Maintenance Program, and um, that's where you actually submit your application, and then you schedule and pass the exam. And the reason we suggest that you assess your readiness and prepare before you uh, submit the application is once your application is approved, you only have three months uh, to schedule and sit for the exam. So if you don't do any type of preparation prior to that, uh, you're going to have to really push it to, to be ready in that three month period. And also, we're always happy to, uh, to examine, to look at a review, an application that has not been submitted. If someone wants to just fill it out and contact us, we'll actually review it and let you know uh, whether or not it will be approved before you invest in the uh, preparation resources. And so there's several ways to prepare for the exam. Uh, you'll find all of these, and I'm sorry, this uh, website at the bottom, I just noticed, if you're just, it's just fm.training, it's not credential CFM prepare anymore. So it's much easier to remember. If you'll just go to uh, fm.training. Excuse me. <coughs> okay, and here you see the exam fees. And again, the uh, CFM is accredited as uh, are the FMP and the SFP. Okay, recertification process. <coughs> Excuse me, one minute. <coughs> um, every three years, the CFM has to uh, recertify. This is done in the same program that you submit your uh, exam application in. Uh, the process is pretty straightforward. Um, and you have three years to do it. So please don't wait mm. until a month before it's due to start thinking about what you need to do. And so, and if you have any questions, we're always happy to help with that. Uh, there's four different uh, categories in which you um, can get activity credit. Uh, one is FM related education, continuing education. Uh, FM practice, professional leadership, and development of the profession. You need six activities to renew. Um, three of those, if you practice full time as a CFM over three years, that's half your uh, activities. So it's not that difficult to acquire the activities. Um, there also is uh, ethics training required now for all new CFMs, anyone recertifying who has not yet done the ethics. And then uh, for recertification, you have to redo the ethics training every other recertification cycle. And um, if your company offers ethics training, you can use that. Uh, otherwise, there's training available through the CAMP program that you can access. It's $20 and it takes about 30 minutes to do. And then you're set for the next six years. Okay, and I'm, I'm not going to read all of these. These are on the, um, the recertification form that uh, is available on the website. 
It's also uh, available in your camp record. But these are just a list of all the activities under each category that you can do. Now, um, on the form in the camp program and on the form in the website, um, it lists the documentation you have to provide for each of these. So you'll know what's required to actually demonstrate that you've met these requirements. But uh, here's a list of the uh, related education. It does not have to be CEUs, basically any training or education that's related to any of the uh, FM competency areas. So that leaves it pretty wide open. And most uh, employers these days have required training every year. I would think particularly for FMs, uh, I mean, OSHA training, uh, emergency preparedness training, any of that can work. You just have to provide documentation. And as I mentioned, working full time as a uh, facility manager, uh, and we only require 750 hours a year. And of course, that's not full time. It's not full time for me. I'm pretty sure it's not full time for any of you. But uh, this covers folks that do consulting. Um, so uh, 750 hours in a calendar year will give you one uh, activity credit towards our recertification. And then under professional leadership, this means serving uh, as an officer, uh, serving on a committee, uh, helping when I mentioned the uh, job task analysis, uh, helping with anything um, related to uh, FM or to promoting the, um, the industry. And then development of the profession, this is the longest one. Uh, and this goes everywhere from doing a presentation to teaching a course, to even just reading journals or reading books related to FM, uh, which um, I had to have two slides because there's so many things listed here. But all this information, like I said, is on the website and it's also in the uh, renewal document that's uh, in the CAMP program. Our, our completing FM surveys, uh, our focus groups. And then uh, attendance at regular industry meetings, meaning your chapter meetings, council meetings, or even if it's uh, an organization that's not related to IFMA, but is related to FM, those count. And documentation, this is the biggest issue we have. People either ask uh, or either say, I have no idea what you want for documentation, or they'll send me whole book, which we don't need because we have to upload that. Um, but it doesn't, uh, the, the, what is listed in the worksheet is all you need to provide. And uh, rural workplace or facility fusion attendance, you do not have to, you have to list it because otherwise we won't know you attended, but you don't have to provide documentation. We can always verify that. And then uh, chapter leadership position since 2015, of course, if you're renewing now, it will be after that um, because we can look that up in our CRM program. It, it has it in there if you list it, but everything else uh, you need to have documented. And um, we look at all the recertification forms that come in we don't open everything that's documented and check except for 10% of the uh, research forms are actually audited. That's an ANSI requirement. And we do actually open the documentation and make sure it matches. So um, be sure that when you submit it and, and the, our program automatically chooses uh, who the 10% are. So uh, we don't have any choice over that or else we would obviously choose people we know always turn their stuff in. But um, be sure that if you have any questions on documentation, you let us know. And then here's a list of the recertification fees. Um, obviously, if my members uh, get a discount on those fees, and um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the way it goes. You, you, you all know that you have an expiration date, but once that date comes, you go into a 90 day grace period. Uh, so we're not just gonna chop your credential off because it's expired. We actually hope that you'll have turned your research in, but uh, even if you haven't, you've got 90 days, which uh, nothing changes. There is a second 90 days that you can actually submit your recertification, but that's called the uh, cancellation pending uh, period. And there is a $100 late fee if you wait that long to, uh, to recertify. 
So it's much better to get it in. And you can send your recertification in up to six months prior to your um, expiration date. So uh, that gives you uh, nine months to actually do it. We start sending notices out six months before you expire. We send them out once a month. Once you expire, we send them out um, twice a month during your grace period. And then during your cancellation period, we send them out every week. So it's really important that you keep your uh, email address current with us so that we are sending them to the correct place. And we try our best in the last month to actually call uh, everyone who is pending cancellation. And so far, we do actually a pretty good job of it. So we do everything we can to keep you in the fold, but uh, you've got to make sure that your contact information uh, stays current with us. And over three years, uh, very often that changes. Okay, and the final thing I'm going to mention is our uh, credential badging program. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but uh, Credly is the company that we have partnered with for our uh, badging. And uh, you basically don't have to do anything uh, to get your, well, you do have to do something, but it's not an application process. Uh, once you uh, get your uh, credential, regardless of which it is, or you renew it, uh, Credly automatically gets a report from us and they update the badge information. So uh, some, obviously a lot of people use it on LinkedIn, but other people use it on their business cards or uh, in various ways. So uh, just to let you know, if you, uh, you, everyone who currently holds a credential should have received a notification about the badging. Uh, if for some reason you didn't, or you didn't know what it was and you didn't claim it, because I had a lot of people say, is this spam or did you really send it? Um, if you, um, if you have any questions or you didn't actually accept your badge, if you let us know, Crystal is the one who handles that. You can send an email to uh, credentials at ifma.org and, and get that taken care of. So any of you who have uh, any questions or any issues, uh, not just regarding this, but anything related to your credentials can always reach us at credentials at ifma.org. We check that daily. Um, and any of you who uh, might be interested in uh, purchasing a credential program for your staff, um, then you can reach out to Corporate Connections. And right now, um, this concludes our presentation. So I will be very open if anyone has any questions. Hi, um, thank you so much for this. It was um, very helpful for me. Um, I have my CFM, so I'm looking at the recertification. I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. The anniversary of it um, on the day that um, we got our certification. So I received mine in April of 2019. So is it April to April that I need to get, get the points or is it a calendar year? It's, um, well, number one, it's not April to April anymore. It used to be. Now everyone, we're moving everyone to a December 31st expiration date. So even though you uh, got the um, credential in April, uh, it act, your expiration date is actually December 31st, three years after that. Like you would go to April three years from there and then it got pushed to uh, December 31st. And so it's just your active period that you're looking for your activities is between when you got the credential and December 31st. Now, if you go into your grace period and you don't have sufficient um, uh, points, I mean, you can go into your grace period and still accrue activities. You just can't turn around the next year and say, oh, well, I did this in February if you used it. So, I mean, that, uh, and that's really hard for us to check, you know, it's most, mostly the honor system where those kind of details come into play, but um, we do have ethics in place for our CFM, so hopefully that's not something that happens very often. Um, I have another follow-up question. Sure. So if during the first year, which wasn't a full 12 months, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to get points in every category, it, can I again use sort of use point from the next calendar year? To do yes, it, it does. The, the only, um, the only, you can do multiple, like you can, you could take 15 hours for, for edu the education uh, category. Five hours of uh, training or education is one activity. You don't have to do that 
every year. You could do 15 hours at one time and that would be your three activities. The only one that, the only areas that don't allow that are the practice, obviously. The practice, you can only count one year at the time for practice. Um, and like serving as an officer for um, say your chapter, you, you can't claim unless you have two positions then I suppose you could but you can't claim more than one activity per year for that. Um, but everything else, well, the chapter meetings, but you say you do three presentations during one year uh, for um, category four, you could use all three of those. So six activities in your all in for your three years. Correct. Spread out in any in, in any way, like I said, the only ones you can't double dip for are like the practice or the being an officer or, or something that, you know, you, you assume is a position like for a year. Um, or the, or the journal read, you're supposed to read five journals in a year. You can't read like 15 and say, well, I've read one five each year. You need to actually spread that out. But we honestly have no way of, of, of tracking that. So once again, uh, it's assumed that our uh, CFMs are um, uh, ethical folks. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, and one thing I actually had written on one of the slides and I realized I forgot to say, probably when I was having my coffee and attack, was that the camp program we are upgrading uh, in the spring. Uh, there will be uh, some, so if you, um, if well, if you expired in, Dece in December and you need to get your uh, renewal in, please do it like right away so we can process it before M March is when we're looking at the uh, the transition. Um, and you know, any time of the transition, we we are careful as we can be. But I would hate for someone to have a recertification form hanging out there that got lost in the in the transfer to the new program. But if you are not um, don't need to do it until after that. I would wait till like later in April because the program is meant where you can add your things as you go. I always suggest you keep a copy somewhere, but you can add things into the program as you go. Not particularly like practice, but if you do education or, or training, you can you can load that and then it'll it'll be there when you actually go to renew it. But uh, I would hold off on doing that until like April, until we get the new program up and running. Um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be different. Obviously, the processes work the same, but anytime you have a new program, it's gonna uh, it's gonna look different and feel different. But since most CFMs only go into the camp program once every three years, I, I don't think they're that attached to it. Hopefully, it's not going so, to be an so, issue. So, Rhonda, this is Phil Donnie. I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So, my eligibility ran out on December thirty first, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I know that once I'm going to go through the camp and apply um, for another Prometric, you know, testing site, should I wait till after March to do that? Oh, no, no, no. You can do that now. Uh, you can, um, there's a form in your record called uh, extend eligibility. You can go fill that out um, and it'll extend your eligibility for another three months. Okay. If I do that towards the end of the summer, is that going to be a problem? Again, no, uh, not it, it would typically be, but not right. with COVID. Uh, yeah. We're we're pretty um, we're, we're having to be pretty lax, <laughs> just <laughs> because uh, people have either had lots of spare time where they could study and and go for the exam, but there haven't been exam centers open, right. or they have been uh, killing themselves working, and haven't had time to prepare. So we, I, I, at least for the next for sure six months probably nine months we will be as lax as we can we still have to follow certain rules just to keep our ANSI accreditation but as far as extending eligibility um, I don't foresee that as being a problem thank you any more questions I, I have a quick question this is Eric mm -hmm. um, thank you for the presentation very uh, informative is there any um, if we reach the the worksheet and have enough credits can we submit it earlier than the not and not any more than six months okay and then is the worksheet i mean essentially just something that we're keeping ourselves uh you know whether it's a paper copy or an excel spreadsheet or something is there any opportunity for like a 
portal where it's saved in our IFMA. Yes, and it, 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 that's what I was talking about when I said we're getting a new program, and uh, I wouldn't uh, upload, I wouldn't put anything in it now. I mean, obviously, we make every effort we can to make sure everything goes. But I've had people say uh, I put everything in there, and then it just it went away. Well, and if that happens, there's nothing. I mean, chances are it wasn't actually put in there. But I always suggest that you keep your own file folder of your documentation somewhere, at least until it's approved. Then after that, once we say, yes, it's processed and you're renewed, it's not necessary for you to keep it. But um, you, you can ideally, you know, over the three-year period, as things happen, you upload them so you don't have to scurry around at the end and do it all at one time. But even if you have to do it all at one time, for like for the three years of, um, of practice, uh, it just asks for your job description. I mean, so you just upload that. And for training, you almost always either get an email confirmation or some sort of certificate if you've done training, you just upload that. So, you know, it's not very, for, for only six activities, it's not, uh, it doesn't seem to me to be um, terribly demanding, but according to some people it can be, I guess. Thank you. Rhonda, did you see um, Matt's question on, is there a place to run through a practice exam or see um, yes uh, if you go to um fm.training um uh, it and then look for the cfm it will list all there there's practice exams and now um our new website we just we we have new um marketing folks and they have really done an amazing job of bringing our website up to the what is this 22nd century? I'm, I'd say up to the 20th century because before it was a little antiquated. But um, they just, and you'll have to put your name and your email. And of course that's gonna open you up to marketing stuff, but they just created a really good document um, about preparing for the CFM. Uh, it, it does the self-evaluation for the, all the competency areas. And there are, I think 10 or 11 uh, just general practice questions on there. They just sent it to me to look at a few days ago, so I'm pretty sure it's live. And uh, and that's, you just go, I mean, you just go online and can get that. But there is a practice exam that you can actually purchase um, that if you go to fm.training and you can actually, um, it's much, it's longer and much more detailed than this. But I suggest you go to the IFMA website and, and cho choose that just to uh, get familiar with everything. They've done a really nice job with that. And that is how we start our, so we have a CFM study hall that um, we do twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, that starts in February and that's mm -hmm. how it starts. Everyone takes the practice, a group practice exam mm -hmm. and gauges where the deficiencies are and so forth. And then there's um, one to two competencies that are um, covered. So Matt, if you're interested as members, um, you can attend that study hall for free. So, and that starts February 2nd, and we do have space. And it is, due to COVID, all online. All oh, virtual, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Excellent. All right. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>